Welcome to my continued reading of Romanism and the Reformation by H. Grattan Guinness. I'll pick up where I left off at page 214. The persecuted Waldenses were students of prophecy from the oldest times. How did they interpret the prophecies concerning Babylon and the man of sin? Here in this book of Lagers is their treatise on Antichrist, written in the year 1120, or nearly 800 years ago. It is written in a language now extinct. Lager gives a French translation in parallel columns. In simple telling terms, that treatise brands the Romish church as the harlot Babylon and the papacy as the man of sin and Antichrist. That was the faith and confession of the Waldenses. Turn now for a few moments to Bohemia. You remember that it is an extensive province in the northwest of Austria. Their Reformation sprang up more than a century before the time of Luther and was quenched in seas of blood. What gave rise to it? The testimonies of John Huss and Jerome of Prague, what did these men hold as to the Church of Rome and the Papacy? That Rome is Babylon and the Papacy the Antichrist. An Epistle of John Huss unto the people of Prague. The more circumspect ye ought to be, for that Antichrist laboreth the more to trouble you. The last judgment is near at hand. Death shall swallow up many. But to the elect children of God the kingdom of God draweth near. Know ye well, beloved, that Antichrist being stirred up against you deviseth diverse persecutions. Acts and Monuments, Volume 3, pages 497 and 498. A letter of John Huss to the Lord John de Clum. By your letter which I received yesterday I understand first things. How the iniquity of the great strumpet, that is, the malignant congregation, whereof mentioned is made in the Apocalypse, is detected and shall be more detected, with which strumpet the kings of the earth do commit fornication, fornicating spiritually from Christ, and as is there said, sliding back from the truth and consenting to the lies of Antichrist through his seduction and through fear, or through the hope of confederacy, or getting of worldly honor. Acts and Monuments, Volume 3, page 499. Letter of John Huss, wherein he comforteth his friends, and willeth them not to be troubled for the condemning of his books, and also declareth the wickedness of the clergy. Master John Huss, in hope the servant of God to all the faithful who love him, and his statutes, wisheth the truth and grace of God. Surely, even at this day, is the malice, the abomination, and filthiness of Antichrist revealed in the Pope and others of this council. Oh, how acceptable a thing should it be, if time would suffer me to disclose their wicked acts, which are now apparent, that the faithful servants of God might know them, I trust in God that he will send after me those that shall be more valiant, and there are alive at this day that shall make more manifest the malice of Antichrist, and shall give their lives to the death for the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall give both to you and me the joys of life everlasting. This epistle was written upon St. John Baptist's day in prison and in cold irons. I having this meditation with myself that John was beheaded in prison and bonds for the word of God. Acts and Monuments, Volume 3, pages 502 and 503. In the year 1421, the miseries of the Bohemians greatly increased. Besides the executions by drawing, by fire, and by the sword, several thousands of the followers of Huss, especially Taborites of all ranks, and both sexes, were thrown down the old mines and pits of Kutenberg. In one pit were thrown seventeen hundred, in another thirteen hundred and eight, and in a third one thousand three hundred and twenty-one persons. Every year on the 18th of April a solemn meeting was held in a chapel built there in memory of those martyrs until the year 1613, 
when the mint master, Reshazowitz, endeavored to prevent it, yet it continued until the great persecution of 1621. A monument is said still marks the place. Witness their testimony, quoted by Fox, the martyrologist. I have stood on the spot in Constance, where these men were condemned to death. Rome burned them. Here is a history of the Reformation and Anti-Reformation in Bohemia. The Bohemian brethren avowed the doctrines of John Huss, including his views on the anti-papal prophecies. Rome exterminated the reformed Bohemians. The story is a dreadful one, but from their ashes rose new witnesses. From the persecuted Bohemians sprang up the Morovians, who this day are missionaries throughout the world. Turn lastly for a moment to England before the Reformation, 500 years ago. God raised up in this country John Wycliffe. Men called him the morning star of the Reformation. He translated the scriptures into the English tongue and waged wars against the errors and abominations of the Church of Rome. How did Wycliffe interpret these prophecies? Just as the Waldenses did. Here is one of his books filled with references to the Pope as Antichrist. He wrote a special treatise entitled Speculum de Antichristo, The Mirror of Antichrist. From Wycliffe, sprang the English Lollards. They numbered hundreds of thousands. What was their testimony? Let me give it to you in the words of one of them, Lord Cobham, that famous man of God who lived just a century before Luther. When brought before Henry V and admonished to submit himself to the Pope as an obedient child, this was his answer. As touching the Pope and his spirituality, I owe them neither suit nor service, for as much as I know him by the scriptures to be the great Antichrist, the son of perdition, the open adversary of God, and an abomination standing in the holy place. Remaining firm in his rejection of Romish error and refusal to bow down to the papacy, Lord Cobham was condemned to death as a heretic. John Fox tells us that on the day appointed for his death in the year 1417, Lord Cobham was brought out of the Tower of London with his arms bound behind him, having a very cheerful countenance. Then he was laid upon a hurdle and so drawn forth into St. Gillis Fields, where they had set up a new pair of gallows. As he was coming to the place of execution and was taken from the hurdle, he fell down devoutly upon his knees desiring Almighty God to forgive his enemies. Then he stood up and beheld the multitude, exhorting them in the most godly manner to follow the laws of God written in the Scriptures, and in any wise to beware of such teachers as they see, contrary to Christ in their conversation and living, with many other special counsels. Then he was hanged up there by the middle in chains of iron, and so consumed alive in the fire, praising the name of God as long as his life lasted. In other words, he was roasted to death. They were burned, burned. These blessed men of God, Huss was burned, Jerome was burned, Lord Cobham was burned. Even Wycliffe's bones were dug up 41 years later after his death and burned. Savonarola, who preached with trumpet tongue that Rome was Babylon, was burned. All these were burned before the Reformation, and thousands more. They were burned, but their words were not burned. Their testimony was not burned. It lived on. Fire could not scorch it. Chains could not bind it. Gags could not silence it. Jails could not stifle it. Swords could not slay it not could destroy it. Truth is immortal. Truth is unconquerable. Imprison it, and it comes forth free. Bury it, and it rises again. Crush it to the earth, and it springs up victorious. Purer for the conflict, nobler for the victory. The truth to which these confessors witnessed sprang up again a century later, and rolled over Europe the tremendous tide of the Reformation. 
And whence came this testimony which no power could repress? Whence came this testimony trumpet-tongued that Rome in all its myriad-handed might was impotent to silence or arrest? Whence came it but from that sacred volume writ in gloomy prisons, in lands of captivity, in scenes of exile, for the guidance, the preservation, the support of God's suffering saints and faithful witnesses in every age. Daniel the captive, Paul the prisoner, John the exile, such were its inspired authors, men whose piercing vision looked down the long vista of the church's conflicts, marked her martyrdoms and saw her triumphs from afar. O word of divinely given prophecy, O wondrous volume whose seven seals the Lamb has loosed, and open to meet the moral and spiritual needs of the suffering church he loves so well. How have thy solemn utterances, thy mysterious symbols, been scanned and studied by earnest, saintly eyes? How hast thou been pondered in prisons, remembered on racks, repeated in the flames? Thy texts are windows through which the light shines from the third heaven down into the darkest depths of earth's conflicts, mysteries, and woes. O sacred and sanctifying truth, how have thy words been watered with the tears of suffering saints, steeped in their griefs and sorrows, and dyed in the copious streamings of their blood? Precious are the lives which have sealed thee, precious the truth those lives have sealed. Thy words have been wings by which the persecuted church has soared from the wilderness and the battlefield into the purest serene of everlasting love and peace. Like a bright angel, thou art heaven descended and leadest to the skies. By thee has God guided to their glorious consummation the noble army of saints, confessors, martyrs, shining round his throne like the everlasting stars. They are gone into that world of glory forever gone, but the light which led them there remains behind. We cannot touch them. They have vanished from the sight of men, like the prophet whose chariot to heaven was the winged flame. We cannot hear the music of their harping or the thunder of their song, but we still grasp the book they loved, which made them all they were and all they are. Ye will denses from the lonely blood-stained Alps, ye nameless victims of the dreadful Inquisition, ye noble Protestants before the Reformation, Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Cobham, Savonarola, we possess the holy pages which ye pondered, the words of truth and life ye sealed with martyr blood. Be those words to us what they were to you. Let them be our inspiration and our testimony and the testimony of our children after us, till the hour when truth emancipated from all trammels shall shine through the world in its unclouded splendor, and error and superstition and falsehood from its presence shall forever flee away. And that's the end of chapter 5, or lecture 5, if you like, of Romanism and the Reformation, by H. Grattan Guinness.